Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. On this episode, we're discussing warning labels for controversial films, reviews of The Five Bloods and Artemis Fowl, and our topic this week is a movie battle royale, where we debate what is the greatest summer franchise of the 2000s. Are you ready? Because I could do this all day. Here we go. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today are my fellow host, John Davenport. Hey, Aaron. How you doing today? Wonderful. And Amanda Sink. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. We are hello. back. Hello. Why, hello. Let's just do this for 20 minutes. Hey. <laughs> hello. Hola. Hi. You already messed it up, John. You're just supposed to say hello. Hola. Como esta? <laughs> hello, mate. <laughs> Okie doke. Ciao. Oscars, up- <laughs> Oscars update. And that's what happened. Everybody just hung up. Hung up? We're not on a call. It's been... <laughs> Everyone just deleted us off their app. Why am I still trying to talk? I don't even know. <laughs> Oscars update. It's been pushed back two months next year, so it'll come out in April as opposed to the end of February. And now the eligib- eligibility period goes to February 28th, 2021, which I just don't... That doesn't make any sense to me. So basically... One year gets two additional months, and the next year is going to get two less months. I don't understand the logic behind that. It would still qualify for the following year if uh, I don't get. They're it. just afraid that Sonic is going to get awards. <laughs> That's fair. yeah. It's exactly the problem. Who are you going to give all the awards to? Sonic and Harley Quinn and who else? Best Oscars ever. Invisible Man. Yeah, there you go. I'm fine with that. We have one contender, one real contender. <laughs> Man, Martin Lawrence for Best Actor. I could do that. Could you imagine? No. Even Martin Lawrence couldn't imagine that. Really? No. <laughs> Mess everything up and everybody who knows the Oscars so well when they do their prediction ballots, they'll just lose all that money. <laughs> and like people who have no idea about Oscars will just randomly try to participate because they're like, hey, I saw that movie at home. Well, here's the thing, though. Like, No matter what you do, if you add a couple months to next year's or this year's eligibility, you're basically going to have to take away from the following year's eligibility, right? So I don't get the logic behind that. I don't either, unless they keep it like February going forward. I mean, sure. There's only been 14 movies that are released in 2020. It, it happens. You're including streaming. That that opens the doors for quite a quite a few things. Yeah, that does seem silly if they're including streaming into the into the Oscars. So hopefully, if everything goes all right, we'll be a reset next year. So what's the point? Much of the entertainment news over the past week has resolved over canceling shows like the long running cops and also live PD and even Rolling Stone advocated to get rid of Law and Order SVU because Olivia Benson glamorizes cops. You will stop that, Rolling Stone. That is a fantastic show. Amazon is considering pulling the Dukes of Hazard over its depiction of the Confederate flag, as well as 12 Years a Slave filmmaker John Ridley. He penned an op-ed in the LA Times citing the issues with Gone with the Wind, which in case you didn't know, Inflation Included is the biggest film of all time. I don't. A lot of people don't know that. It is the biggest film of all time, dollar-wise. Uh, which, along with some on social media asking them to pull it, led HBO Max to pull the film. They say temporarily. At the time, it sure seemed like it was going to be forever. But temporarily, because the film is, quote-unquote, this is their quote, a product of its time and depicts some of the ethnic and racial prejudices that have, unfortunately, become commonplace in American society. These racist depictions were wrong then and are wrong today, and we felt that to keep this title up without an explanation and a denouncement of those depictions would be irresponsible. So here we go. All that to get to this. We we tend to stay away from overly controversial topics here because our number one goal is to be fun and entertaining and not split everyone. But we're going to take a look at this from a broad perspective regardless. Is adding disclaimers or pulling shows entirely something that should be commonplace when a film revolves around controversial themes well this has to be the like the broadest perspective we can offer considering yeah because i mean if you in my mind and this is just my perspective of that is if you just focus on this one specific issue when there's so many other issues that are offensive to many pe- various people especially you know these days uh, is it really fair to just limit it to one scope i mean if you're going to say that 
the potential is there. Isn't it a much more broader topic, really? That's, my, I guess, my question. You know, the, the, the only analogy I can come up with is when I was in art school, we had our art history class. And part of the art history class was to go through film. And each time we would go into a film and, and, and discuss the topics within that film, we'd get a primer for that film and talk about wh- when it was created, what the frame of mind of the people are, were at the time, and, and where they were intending on going with the film. And it helped us as students broaden our perspective on what the movie was we were watching and gave us the ability of looking at it as purely an art form versus looking at it as trying to convert any uh, any other sort of message that might be there. I'm not against the idea of putting a primer in front of something saying this reflects a different time and a different age, and there are still lessons that can be derived from this, though the lessons now could be much different than they were then. I'm fine with having a disclaimer. I think it's easy enough for you to put something in front of it that says, this was a product of its time, trigger warning, this contains blah, blah, blah. We had no problem and were not really phased too much by it when it came to ratings for television shows, and they would always have something in the corner Mm -hmm. or in the front. And so I don't know why we can't have something for that. And it becomes a teaching moment when it's implemented into our society where we can say, okay, why is this? What does this warning mean? What is it trying to say? What is the purpose? And what am I going to see in the film that might reflect that? Because there are a lot of people who don't have the opportunity, or maybe they didn't when they were a child, to get the same education as everyone else. And so if they're not informed, or maybe they had a very ballooned lifestyle, you know, they were stuck in their circle and only had their experiences and never diversified. And maybe they grew up and they started to change and and they didn't fully understand what was wrong until people sometimes point it out and help you learn. And so I think it's important for something like that. Now, if it's already educational, if the purpose of it is to, you know, it's going to inform you on its own, then you probably don't need a disclaimer. But if it's something where it's like, it's, I don't want to, I don't want to keep saying glorifying because sometimes it's not glorifying. Sometimes it's just, it's accepted in the film. Like, nobody has any issues with anything that's going on. Maybe there's laughter about it, whatever. Like, it was intended to be humorous. You should certainly put a disclaimer on for something like that in the beginning of the film. Here's my thing. I don't have an issue with a disclaimer. I actually, I mean, when we have ratings, like you said, and typically you get an explanation of the rating at the beginning, I'm fine with that. I have no problem with that. In fact, I encourage that. I think it's important for people to realize this is a product of its time, et cetera. I don't want a mandatory history lesson before any movie. For, for any movie, on any topic. I don't know if that's necessarily a, a good idea, for, especially when it's, it's fictional. And, and I, know, I know people will feel it's glamorizing the Confederacy, and it's glamorizing slavery and, and whatnot with that specific film. And in my mind, and this is just speaking from someone who has a great appreciation for film and film history, and I know there's a lot of bad history with that film, and, including Kenny McDaniel and, and how she won an Oscar, but wasn't really allowed to really win an Oscar. I mean, there's a lot of backstory behind that. I found this out. Did you know Clark Gable almost uh, didn't go to the premiere to stand up for her, but she actually talked him into going? That's part of the history. I didn't know that. That was an interesting I didn't know that fact. either. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. But regardless, they were talking about including a basically a dissertation or some kind of discussion on slavery before the film. Now, if it's not mandatory, I'm all for it. Like, the more you know... There's something, you know, kind of like how you watch a a film now and it'll give you other things to watch or it says, do you want to watch an information video or something along those lines? That's great. If it's mandatory, then I have, that's where I have an issue because if you think of it broadly, and I'm trying to be like very broadly here, Hogan's Heroes, would that need a disclaimer on World War II? Most films on gangs or mobs glamorizes the killers of those organizations. I mean, I think most of us would agree. Look at The Godfather. They're, They're basically heroes. If you watch that, Dexter glamorizes serial killers. Marnie contains, which is a classic film that many people love and I hate, but it contains, much like Gone with the Wind, I'm not a fan of that film either, contains a a husband literally raping his wife and then the film portrays their relationship as healthy. John, you know, your wife's a big fan of that movie. Oh yeah. It's a very disturbing connotation in that film, but they portray it as healthy, which is, would be seen very differently by today's standards. Any film where a uh, man hits a woman or is brashly homophobic 
which happened all the time before the eighties, you know, those kinds of things would, would they need some kinds of, and you know, it's just, it's just they when we're talking about doing this and, and we're including that, you know, it's never going to be just for one thing. And I just want to know, like, where is the line? Like, where does it fit? Where doesn't it fit? Why does it fit? You know, it, is it something where it's not portraying itself as historical fact? It's just portraying itself as a fictional representation of a book. Does that still warrant that? Does that still warrant a mandatory teaching lesson, so to speak? Or would just a disclaimer do? You know, to me, I think a disclaimer with a stick around at the, after the credits for an annotation annotation of where to find more information about this That's subject great. would have, would be better. They've done that for all sorts of things. Stick around for the credits for this sort of vignette on what happened in this movie or the creation of this movie. Why not do that for, especially seeing how a lot of this media is now, we're watching it all digitally anyways, a, a nice annotative look as being able to hit here and go to this documentary or something on this subject line would be a much better way to do that as well as give us a better way to not just go about this with our feelings but be armed with with history and facts to develop our feelings with see i'm really in line of thinking yes disclaimers are great and i actually love the idea of afterwards having you know if you want to find out more do this but i I think it would be really easy to just I shouldn't say really easy. I know it's not going to be easy, but I feel like it would be beneficial to add something into our rating system. When you talk about how a film is rated, and and I realize this is going to vary through countries, Mm -hmm. but at least for America, if you add it to our rating system, you can know, just like we know if it's rated R, (laughs) you know, I'm not going to show this to my child because it's rated R and it might have nudity, violence, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. You could have some sort of a rating on it that maybe goes in with the other ratings that or a tag. And it basically represents that this is an inaccurate or fictionalized part of history. Like this is not, do not take away from it that this is okay or that this is how things actually happened that I feel like would be really helpful because then you can you can just look at the rating and you would know oh this is PG-13 and whatever the you know the acronym or whatever would be for it it's real like it happened it just didn't happen in this (laughs) particular way and the movie which I gotta say again like I'm not a fan of the movie so I'm definitely not defending Gone with the Wind it's, it's a very problematic film on its own it's just a matter of like when you're talking about adding things to movies or requiring things for movies to be seen. That's where I I think, you know, there's a broad spectrum of films that that covers. It's not going to be just that one. So what are we ultimately saying is okay for the scope of mankind in terms of, of film? I like the ratings aspect, especially because streaming platforms, you know, a lot of them, a lot of these films like Gone with the Wind, a little kid could start that movie. And it would play because it's, I don't think it's, it's rated in a way where it would be perceived as an adult. It's an old film. I, I believe it's not going to be rated R. I don't believe it's rated R because they didn't really have anything rated R back then. So what I think would be great is if you do, like if you have a parental lock, it wouldn't play on that in, unless your parent approved it. So your parent could actually be involved in that respect. I think that would be important. That's a good thing to do. For certain films, especially if they have, you know, ugly atrocities involved, uh, even even if it's a positive film, like In the Heat of the Night is a is a classic, and it's a great film on racial inequality. On the but it has some heavy issues that if a kid were to play it, they wouldn't understand the context or the depth. They wouldn't they wouldn't be able to understand the complexity of it. So that would be more important to me to have like stuff like that where it has adult themes or, or heavy handed elements. Marnie would def- definitely fit that bill as well. Uh, where it couldn't play if a kid wanted to play it, if they had a parental lock on it and only the parents could authorize it because the rating would trigger because you would have whatever those elements are that you're talking about, Amanda, that would be introduced that they would add into the streaming portal. Well, and here's another thing to think about. So let's say that we decided to add these disclaimers to films and it sounds like from the conversations we're having so far, it's really like after it comes out for release, not necessarily in the theater. But if even if they did it in the theater, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to to go home. And things change. We evolve. The things that were acceptable in the 80s are now not acceptable. The things that are occurring whoa, in our Whoa, film, whoa, whoa. Indy is fine. Uh, Goonies <laughs> is fine. 
E.T. is fun. So far, just wait. But here, but <laughs> well, they took to- the Gunzo out of E.T. a couple times, and then they put him back in, and then they took him out again, and then they put him back in again. That's true. That was dumb. And so if we think about right now, what we're watching and experiencing is at some point there's going to be the natural evolution and progression of our society, and there's going to come a point where we say, oh, this isn't funny anymore. Oh, this is an issue that because something happened, that's not something that we want to just say, hoorah, that was so funny, that was great, or yeah, that was thrilling. If you make it where it's part of a rating system, you're just going forward and you're saying, this film may have elements that are going to be sensitive to some viewers or whatever the trigger warning would be and and breaking it up into certain like different elements, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's um, racial inequality, racial injustice, whether it's gender norms um, and LGBTQ, all of those issues. Like if you break them out and say that these may have sensitive issues, just like they've done for nudity and so on, then you have kind of like that forefront, and then it's just part of all of the films as they come out. Part of the other problem is that there are just going to be people out there who will look at something like this, no matter what it is, and decide they got a wild hair up their butt and decide to make a story out of it. Like (laughs) the best example of that is, you know, Tropic Thunder was doing great, and everyone thought it was a fun movie, funny, and all of a sudden some people decided to make a big stink about the fact that there was a character on it doing blackface, and they wanted to try to cancel Robert Downey Jr., Mm -hmm. Not understanding the that context. the whole purpose of his character was the joke about white people who think they can do anything they want. Yeah. And, and well, that's part of cancel culture. I mean, I, there's a lot of that where I feel like every day I'm, somebody's trending that they want, somebody wants to cancel. You know, they just, <laughs> Hollywood Outsider is probably going to hit there at some point. I mean, maybe for this episode. Don't say that. Trending used to be <laughs> such a good thing. And we used to be like, oh, let's see if we can get this this hashtag trending. Now it's like you see something, you see Betty White's name, and you're like, hold on a second, something horrible has happened oh. because this person is trending. Oh, I know. I saw Tarantino on there like, oh, this is not the time. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's going to trend badly, it's going to be Tarantino. Damn it, Quentin. What about the feet? Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, but I know a lot of people were upset that it was that it was pulled to begin. You know, there's people that were mad that it was there, and there are people that were mad that it was was pulled. I really didn't know anybody was was just dying to watch a streaming version of Gone with the Wind. But I know it's. I mean, it literally is with inflation the most popular film of all time. Now you you can make of that what you will in terms of our society, but most of that money came out many many years ago. They they earned that money decades ago when the the world was a different place so in terms of that film why it needs a disclaimer it's because if you've seen it you get it if you haven't seen it i don't recommend it i don't think it's a good movie (laughs) but it definitely has culture and sensitivity is the nicest way i can say it and i don't think any movie should be censored that's my biggest like that would be where i would be concerned you want to put a label on it or warning label or tell people that they can find more education about some i think that's that's great as long as you don't make the education portion mandatory, I don't want to sit through a 15 minute thesis on something I already know about because the streaming network is just trying to do something good. I, I think that should be optional. Warning label, great. Informational video, optional. I'm fine with that. As long as you don't censor. If you start censoring, that's where I would have a problem with any film being censored. I just feel like let the art stand for itself. If it's horrible, we'll judge that. And we should be able to make that determination ourselves because that's where you interfere with free speech. I'm a big advocate for free like speech. Like removing guns from cartoons. Uh, you know what? That, But that's the studio making their own choice. I don't have, that's not censorship. People keep right. saying that censorship. That's it is true. not that's censorship. True. They chose to do that. If they made a remake of Gone with the Wind, I promise you, they well, A, they couldn't do it because if you're basing it on the source <laughs> material, there's no way they can improve that. They already took out a lot of the stuff. Like, a uh, clan is very prominent in the book. It's not prominent in the film. The, the word clan, you know, it's just a, it's a political meeting. I think is what they call it. What? But in terms of Looney Tunes, you know, they took the guns out. They put other weapons in Elmer Fudd's hand. <laughs> Who? That's the studio's choice. You didn't notice until people pointed it out. I would argue. I didn't. I had no, John. Did you <laughs> notice? I had no idea. I wasn't even thinking about it. I watched all the older ones before I've even gotten to the new ones. And I can tell you that all the ones that I watched, like the guns weren't even that important. 
I, yeah, I don't really care that about that stuff. It's it's funny to me what what makes the news and what yeah. becomes something bigger than it really is. But I think it's important to the aspect that you've noted, Aaron, which is that if it's something that the original makers have decided, we're going to change this. Mm-hmm. If this is something right. that we want to do, then by all means. And that's definitely different than somebody else saying, mm, we don't like that, so we're not going to play this part. Could you imagine the horror films that would be limited <laughs> uh, <laughs> in yeah. this day if they were re-released? Probably should be. Some of them. Some of them, you know. But it's very important that people understand that is not censorship. It just is not. That is the studio making a choice. When E.T. was edited to take the guns out and put, what they put, walkie-talkies in their hands, I think. Is walkie-talkies what in their hands. That was Steven Spielberg's decision. That was the filmmaker's decision. And then he he retconned it because he's like, that was just dumb. George Lucas changed in his movies every 15 seconds. That's the filmmaker's decision. That is not censorship. Censorship is when we don't like what's in Gone with the Wind because it offends people, rightly so, and we go in and we change it. Our outcry forces them to, to change it. That is censorship or makes them feel like they have to change it. That is censorship. If they're choosing to do it, and it's not a matter of outcry, they just, they don't want to do that anymore. It's just problematic for them to continue with that practice that's not censorship it's going back to an existing property and altering it for anything other than the artistic vision of it way to go all right so we're all good with it then like throw throw some warning labels on there okay cool i was kind of i was kind of wondering because i many people were not for that and they they find this to be a a problem i i don't see the problem but i am curious where does that line lead because i wasn't kidding you know hogan's heroes is a comedy taking place in world war ii where, yeah, you're kind of rooting for American heroes, but, I mean, is it really that funny? In today's world, is it really, really that funny? I don't know. Well, I remember when, when Warner Brothers first released the platinum editions of the Warner Brothers, or the, of the Looney Tune cartoons, one of the first things that they people noticed was that at the beginning of each disc, there was, you had people like Whoopi, Whoopi Goldberg and a few other actors reading what was on the screen, which is all about how... There's images that may shock you in these cartoons, but they are a product of their time, mm-hmm. and they do, and they do not reflect the views and the feelings of the company, you know, at the time of their release, you know, and that was something that I thought was smart, and people were both appreciative and found it a little annoying because, like, you know, of course they don't feel like that way, but I don't know. I mean, I I, I think a warning is always better than no. The smoking is, I- smoking people like the, the warnings, right? <laughs> yeah, I suppose. And I get a little concerned with the impulsivity of just immediately removing a property because of concern. I, I mean, I get it. Right right now, is they just didn't want the bad press right now. And I, I, mean, I think that's part of it, right? But I yeah. think at that point, at, you mentioned it when you first started talking about this. They did not say, we're going to remove this and we're going to put it back for, <laughs> no, they didn't. you know, with the disclaimer and stuff. It was just, okay, pull it off the shelves. And if we want to talk about... No, well, not off the, the, off the streaming service, not the shelves. You right, can still I, buy it. It was a figure yeah. of speech. Yeah. For all Amazon knows, you can still buy it. <laughs> <laughs> they were promoting the heck out of it. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Well, yeah. And then people bought the crap out of it just to piss off Warner Brothers for some reason, which means that Warner Brothers gets that money anyways. <laughs> good good, good job. Way to go. Sorry. Stupid. I feel like we cut Amanda off four times. Sorry, Amanda. Oh, no. It's okay. It's okay. You guys are having good jokes. I just, that to me is is also concerning because it's one thing if you put out a statement and you say, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be making some alterations to this property so that way there's a warning in advance or, you know, whatever it is that they're going to be doing, but to just rip it and say, no, we're not going to have this out there is also a concern. And I go back to your original point, Aaron, what is our line? Like, if there's no established boundaries, how do you know in policy, how do you know when you're going to do that and when you're not going to do that? It's not up to us. And Right. I get that, Jen, but there are literally, to her point, my point, our point, there are literally thousands of films and TV shows that just have not aged well with, with history and or that glamorizes something truly, truly horrific. And, you know, where is the line? There has to be, there has to be a line. Something like, at some point, you have to just let it stand and hope people do their own research, right? You, you can't go through and do a, a history. Like, I, I understand this is a very popular film. It makes sense to do it. This is the most popular film of all time. But are you going to do it for a small indie where that has the same issue? I mean, I don't know. Where's the line? 
it all comes down to the the theater of public opinion. It, True. It's not. It has yeah. nothing to do with the company and what they want, and it has nothing to do with us as individuals or what we intend. It has to do with the theater of public opinion. And once the public opinion starts leaning one way or the other, companies these days, especially these days, because as we mentioned before, cancel culture is such a big thing, and people are so easy, so quick to jump on bandwagons that companies have to be proactive and at least be willing to show in one way that they will. They will work with the populace as a whole. So if a whole bunch of people say this is a problem, then uh, but then you you do see that there's a, another voice that says, well, not so much. Then you have to have find a company has to find the middle ground to make it work. It's their problem. They're they're the actual owners of the property, and it, we just have to hope that if you think those pieces of history are, or even if you want to call them history, uh, those pieces of entertainment are important, that, that they still need to be out there, then you need to hope that those people don't just shelve it or put it in a vault. Are we going to go storming Disney every single time they vault up one of their cartoons just because, hey, they can just vault, vault it for a few years and then re-release it and make a whole bunch of money a few more re- years in the, down the road? No. And, and if it's their product, they can do it. They, well, like Song of the South, you'll never see that again. Dis- Disney's buried right. that deeply. And you know, rightfully so, it's their product. They should do that if they feel that way. Right. That's but my it's point. It's just it's just a crazy to me business decision to without even enough time to have a full conversation about what is the best course of action going forward, and instead just impulsively just ripping it away and then being like, Oh no, after we now have had the conversation, we decided we're gonna backtrack a little. It's just like make a decision and have a conversation. I mean, you're you're making the assumption that it was impulsive. You're making the assumption that they are coming. You know, they did it one way, then they're coming back and saying it another well, way. Well, because they did. Well, they, they <laughs> well, no, did, but companies. They, they also said that they have been built. They have been looking at this, and this just kind of put an expediency on it. Right, but companies like this don't move on a dime. I, decisions like this don't move on a dime. These things are all the Titanic. You have compliance, com- you know, compliance companies have to come in and they have to weigh in. You have lawyers that come in and they have to weigh in on what's possible and what's not possible. Decisions like this don't happen on a dime. It's, everything like this is a, is a Titanic. I think, this but they do happen quickly. relatively quickly in terms of the turnaround and what they're what they actually strategically believe this, is yeah. the right course of action. And to me, this my was, concern... This was very quick. John really put up an article and op-ed on it, and then it was down like the next day. That feels like a pretty quick turnaround, but I'm sorry, Mindy. Yeah, fine. but that's when somebody with deep pockets says, all right, all you morons, we need you <laughs> own a room right now, and we need to talk this out. Right. The, that's still what is involved. You still have 30 people who were probably dragged into a room to have a conversation about what to do, and they had to come to a consensus. What I'm trying to say is that my concern, and this is not about this specific movie, because I, you know, my personal opinion is not being interjected here. I'm just talking about the logistical and, you know, trying to be as broad and fair as possible. When you start just immediately removing properties and things that are available to the public just because you want to have an immediate reaction, which is required of our society. If you do not act immediate enough, there's more concern for you. If you don't text somebody back quick enough, there's concern for you. If a company doesn't respond quick enough, there's a problem with your company and then you get banned. You get, you know, canceled when we talk about cancel culture. And to me, that's not uh, that's not giving businesses the right opportunity to make good decisions and to say, you know what, we do not believe in this. Does our entire group, our entire company understand that we don't stand for this, that we don't believe in this and that we're going to make a change? Why can't they submit a press release that says this is what we're anticipating to talk about today? You know, this is important to us, yada, 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 and then go forward and make a change with informing the public versus, oh, we heard a lot of outcry, boom, it's gone. And then the next day, boom, it's back. But don't worry, we we fixed it. <laughs> and it's like, you don't even realize, like, they're, they're not they having healthy conversations. They're going, not. Yeah. And they're not really fully evaluating what even just to the opposite side, should that movie even be put back out? Like the conversation, there's just not enough time for you to make a huge decision even in a day, even when you have 30 people, if you even have 30 people, and I highly doubt that they did, and it was probably just a bunch of calls saying, 
we're going to talk about this. We need to get this off. We're getting bad publicity. People are freaking out, you know, that rightfully sounds, so. This is right. not great. So that's what the concern is. But I want I want companies to feel and actually believe what they're doing at the same time. And if they're not having a conversation, I can't believe that they have everyone on their team on board going forward. They don't have a real plan or a real vision about how they're going to handle this going forward and what the lines and the boundaries are. Especially if for it's doing just, like just for one movie. If you're just doing it for one movie, that's a response to outcry. That's not a legitimate company plan. But they might be looking at it now. Now that it's been brought to a great light, they might be looking yeah, at it. Yeah, and then hopefully the conversations are happening about what they're going to do going forward. Right. And hopefully being future-minded of, okay, eventually we're going to have products that we're putting out right now that are going to be an issue. How are we going to handle that going forward? You know, put something in place that allows you to come back and revisit the status quo of that film. You know what? That's a perfect segue. She just mentioned future and we just did a Back to the Future series edition on Patreon. So if you want to help support the show, we'll move on from this. I think we, we've we all three talked ad nauseum on this topic. I think you get the gist of it. Add some some labels. But Patreon, if you want to support your favorite podcast, you go to patreon.com slash The Hollywood Outsider and you get immediate access to whatever tier you sign up for. And we, like I said, have a Back to the Future series edition that we just put up. We're, we're not doing Bad Movie Night this summer. We're going to do something where we focus on some of our favorite franchises to tie into this whole episode. And you'll uh, also, and later this month, get some behind the scenes on our 400th episode, which is coming out next week. All right, now we've got some spoiler free reviews. We're going to start with Artemis Fowl on Disney+. Plus. All right, so Aaron caught this one. Artemis Fowl is a 12-year-old genius and a descendant of a long line of criminal masterminds. He soon finds himself in an epic battle against a race of powerful underground fairies who may be behind his father's disappearance. Your unofficial review, Aaron, cited that watching Artemis Fowl is like thinking you're going to Disney World and instead end up tripping on LSD while trapped inside the ball pit at a Chuck E. Cheese. I so want to watch this movie now. <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk more about this. Tell me more. So the movie's directed by Kenneth Branagh, and I love Kenneth Branagh. I find him to be a wonderful director, usually. This is a, a movie that's visually stimulating. There's a lot of cool effects. There's a there's an aspect called a time freeze, where the fairies basically freeze time in a certain location, and they go in and they get things done. Love that. That was, that was really neat. Unfortunately, the movie is just like all over the place. I mean, I... I don't. I didn't read the books, but I know enough to know that Artemis Fowl is a criminal mastermind. And this apparently is building up to that. I. I don't. He doesn't really steal anything. He is really in a house primarily for most of the movie. It's just. It's just a clutter bomb of badness. There's just nothing coherent going on. It's all over the place. It feels like the story isn't quite sure what story he wants to tell. I feel like it's a couple books mixed together. It's only an hour and a half, and this is a world that obviously needed to be fleshed out. Yikes. Yeah. And, so... and Judy Dench is in this, and she looks like she was drugged and dragged to set. I mean, I, I almost, I was looking for strings. I'm like, is she a marionette? Is that not really Judy Dench? It's just like, a, hello, I am Judy, and I am here. You know, it just did not look like she needed or wanted to be there. Well, that was my next question. So you've got Judy Dench and Josh Gad in the same film uh. alongside a bunch of kids. And when you have somebody like Judy Dench, you expect everyone to kind of live up somehow, but never live up to her. So did any of the young actors stand out when you have that background of Judy? Yeah, I'm glad you said Judy because I don't think Josh Gad is that great. But he, he, <laughs> no. he did. He's good. He's good. He but. did fine here. He does this voice thing that's horrible, though, where he talks like this the whole movie, and it's not his real voice, and it doesn't work at all. It, Batman? It's like <laughs> it's like Batman if he was being drug across gravel face first. Wearing shoulder pads? Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. It just it just didn't work. Um Laura McDonald is Holly Short. She's a she's a fairy that is doing an investigation and trying to help. I thought she was delightful. That's really Colin Farrell's in it, but he's not in it very much. And he, you know, he's just doing Colin Farrell. There's nothing special there. Uh, Fergia Shaw, Fergia Shaw, I don't know if I said that right. He's actually playing Artemis Fowl, and I just think he's fine. I don't think he's special. So, yeah, I mean, acting-wise, 
really just Laura McDonald was Holly Short. She's the only one that really stood out as somebody I would say, they, they did a good job. If the full price of admission were $10, what are you giving Artemis Fowl? Oh, thank God. I'm so glad it was on Disney+. Plus. I <laughs> <laughs> Three bucks. Three bucks. Wow. I think are visually and... You know, the cinematography is solid. The effects are decent. You know, it's, you know, that's about the only thing that I found remotely redeeming about it. Three bucks. Yep. Wow. Next up, and I, and I caught most of this too. So I'm just, I'm just going to sit back and wait for Amanda to explain some of the details here. But the five bloods, John. Okay, the Five Bloods. Four African-American vets battle the forces of a man and nature when they return to Vietnam, seeking the remains of their fallen squad leader and the gold fortune that he helped them hide. This is directed by Spike Lee. And Amanda, from your notes, this isn't Spike Lee's best work. What happened? (laughs) A lot of things went wrong. And I want to first start off with the things I did like, because I don't want to start off with all of the negatives. So... The original intention of this is to not only show you the bond and brotherhood of these soldiers, but to really identify and show people what additional trauma Vietnam soldiers that were black had and the struggles that they endured, the additional horrible treatment and feeling like, you know, from the way that it was portrayed in this film, even feeling like they fought a war for rights that they were never going to get, that they never did get. And so that message alone is really powerful, and it's one that you can get behind. The issues in the film have nothing to do with that. So I want to I wanna first address that that is a great idea to tackle, and I think that that fully came across for me, despite the issues that I had with it. Some of the way it was done... I don't know if it was done to try to be unique and try to do something different. If so, maybe don't try that again. There were a <laughs> lot of transitions in the aspect ratio. And Aaron, I think you kind of identified that as well, where it was like, wow, okay, we're changing. All right, we're changing again. <laughs> yeah, oh, it, we're changing back. It does 16.9 widescreen, and then it goes to 4.3 pan scan. Um so it's basically doing widescreen and then box, widescreen, box, widescreen, box. Anytime you're in- And it changes once more too later on. Yeah. And well, it also does uh, when you're, when they're taking video on their phone, it'll actually do a box view. So, so basically you would think that when it goes to box, that's, that's a uh, identifier that it's going to be in Vietnam, mm-hmm. which it is for the most of the time, but it also goes to box and then has a little phone on the side when they're taking video phone, <laughs> uh, a phone on the video on their phone. And that's, it's just all over the place, man. It's, it's really clunky, I think. And, and the now traditional where you have the 16.9, even sometimes that would change. So sometimes it would, you'd have that traditional, what we see is now for streaming as the, the present day, cause you're getting some flashbacks to Vietnam, like Aaron said. Normal widescreen. Yep. But then it's going to go to like old school DVD widescreen. <laughs> and you're Anamorphic, like. Anamorphic, I think is. Yeah. How? I like old school, yeah. old school DVD widescreen, but you're just like, how did we make this many transitions just in like what I'm seeing? So we've got that part going on. And then the this is I guess this is my biggest concern. And I don't know how nobody has seemed to notice this other than Aaron. I guess he noticed it, too. Hmm. And he thought I was joking. I was not joking. Oh, I think it's noticeable. Just people. I don't think people are complaining about it. That, okay. Well, I've heard well, other. I've I'll, heard a few other people complain about. It. Okay. Well, I guess I'll be one of the few who will who will say this. It is the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so you have these current day Vietnam soldier veterans, and they're basically going back to where they were to find their friends' remains, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're having this journey present day. But then you have these flashbacks to Vietnam in the same place, and sometimes even the same exact motion of, you know, that they're doing in the present day that they did in the past. And you have this kind of grainy um, aspect to it. So you could tell that it's supposed to be shot. It's supposed to show you that this is older. Mm -hmm. And we all know Vietnam took place in like the 60s. And 70s. And 70s. Early 70s, yeah. But this is like present day because they make a lot of um, comments to Trump. I mean, like a lot (laughs) about him being president. So this is definitely at least post-2016. And somehow, 
the same older actors that have gray hair in present day looked the exact same in old school Vietnam with the same gray hair. Nothing was different about them. Yeah, they used the same actors. For, they did not they didn't try to them. age them down. They didn't use youth, like ones that actors that looked like them. Yeah. The same dudes. It was, you know, it's funny. It, it works better if you're a young actor and you wear makeup showing you're older. It doesn't look as great when you're an older actor trying to go younger. And they actually don't even try to, like they are literally... They look the exact same. Their ages aren't different. I mean, well, I mean, their ages are supposed to be different. I wonder if that was an artistic choice. Well, it was. I think part. I think it's partly because I think my opinion. This is just an opinion. I don't know if this is fact. I haven't heard any interviews or anything. Spike Lee was trying to say these guys never left the war in their minds. Right. I, I felt like that was the mentality it was going for. Like the war is still them. They're still trapped back there, and so they see themselves back in those days. The only thing is, I just don't think it works. If they would have done that in reverse, I think it would have worked a lot better somehow. Like if they would have had some youth appearance or something, then it would have seemed like they always had that with them versus like the gray hair in the 60s, 70s with the exact same gray hair later on. It's like, I don't I don't know about that. Yeah, it's just I don't a- know. It's It's just a bizarre choice. All right. Well, that being said, what is your score? Four dollars. Mm. You didn't like it at all. I was really disappointed with the the visual. Like I, I had a hard time watching it, but I really liked the story and where it went. And that's really where my four dollars comes from. Yeah, that was a hard part because the story was actually pretty good. And but man, you're you're not wrong. And the action was clunky. I just didn't think the action the action scenes screamed were acting. <laughs> which yeah. which is weird because Chadwick Boseman is in it. And Delray Lindo is great in the movie. He is. Certainly. That's worth mentioning for sure. Uh, we've got one more. We'll be real quick with this, please, guys, because uh, this is uh, this is going to be ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so John saw The Family Tree, uh-huh. and an old Panamanian holiday tra- tradition personified as a homeless man disrupts the life of a workaholic animal rescuer to show him the true meaning of love, friendship, and family. Johnny, you're from Panama. Did you feel like you were transported back and reminded of your time there? For most of this movie, no, <laughs> not at all. They, there were some great shots that they put in. So, like one of the things I did appreciate was that there's a, a couple of shots of the city where they didn't mess with a dissolve, where they mm. they do that thing where you it's like a double exposure where you see a picture over a picture garbage. There's a lot of that that kind of happens, but. In the moments where that wasn't happening, like there's a great shot of Ancon Hill, which is a hill that I spent a lot of time on because my dad put up the radio towers on that hill. Uh, there's a couple couple of shots of the Hotel Panama, which is a uh, which is where my family owned a, a fitness club, and I spent a lot of time as a kid running around that fitness club, and I got to see that. And so yeah, there was those few moments, but. For the vast majority of this movie, I spent a lot of time just like wondering what I did wrong in life. <laughs> oh my gosh. So this does not live up to be added to the holiday collection then. You honestly forget that this is a holiday movie. Okay, great. Even with the fact that there's a guy, a homeless Santa Claus uh, tele singer guy who shows up to do a song to make somebody feel better because he gets paid to. They give him a nice tip and he walks off and then he gets brained by some random junkie who saw that he was counting his money in the middle of a park at night. And then he, like, you know, one of the people that he that gave him the money finds him a little bit later and takes him back to his house, undresses him, puts him in bed, and lets him sleep for two days straight. And mm-hmm. nobody goes, This is a bad idea. What's more interesting is what. What is a tele singer guy? A tele tele singer guy. What what exactly is that? Well, I was trying to think of um televangelist? No, not a televangelist. What's the word? I I I uh, a singing telegram guy. That's what I was that's what he is. Oh. Oh. Never got that impression from what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Words. Too many words turned into like I had three sentences that started at the same time you. and turned into you. one one word. <laughs> Was there anything that surprised you or stood out in a positive way? The story itself has some very great messages about 
love and what it means and some great um some great queer messages to it that could have been developed better but the problem in it is that the person who was doing the writing and creating of this whole story just didn't let them sit well enough. They didn't let them sit long enough to create a, a characters that you want to sit with. They didn't let it sit long enough to have him have some great pieces of dialogue or even have actors in which knew how to deliver a dialogue. So there was, it was very problematic. But the story itself, it could easily sit something, you know, with a little bit more cooking and pushing and prodding by more creative hands. The, it could have easily sat with Chasing Amy or there's a great movie that stars Lena Headey and Piper Perabo called Imagine Me and You that it could have sat well in with that. So if the full price of admission were $10, what are you giving the family tree? Uh, $2. So basically just we wasted 15 minutes of your time to tell you don't watch any of these. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one more positive aspect of this thing I want to throw oh, out real we quick. Don't, you already said $2. There's nothing more to say. There really kind of is. So if you are a fan of The Room or Troll 2, I, and not really necessarily a fan of those movies, but just watching something that's so terrible that you have fun with a group of people watching it, I could see some value in that with this movie because it thinks itself it thinks it's so much more serious than it really is, and you can poke so much fun at it and, and just heckle the movie the entire time, and you and your friends would probably have a, fun, a blast watching it. I got a what feeling we won't be getting a request to screen any more of their films. Okay, new releases <laughs> that are coming out uh, here. We've got like we've got four actually. You should have left June nineteenth. Video on demand. David Kep directs Kevin Bacon and Amanda Seyfried. A screenwriter travels to a remote house in Wales with his family so that he can write the sequel to his big hit film, but he begins to regret his decision after suffering from a severe case of writer's block. It's a Blumhouse movie. Mm. Following that, we have Mr. Jones on June 19th. A Welsh journalist breaks the news in Western media that a famine in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. This is uh, starring James Norton and Vanessa Kirby. Disclosure comes out on Netflix on June 19th, which premiered at Sundance. A look at Hollywood's depiction of transgender people and the impact of this on American culture. And Baby Teeth comes out on video on demand June 19th when seriously ill teenager Mila, played by Sharp Objects Eliza Scanlon, falls mainly in love with small-time drug dealer Moses. It's her parents' worst nightmare. But as Mila's first brush with love brings her a new lust for life, things get messy and traditional morals go out the window. Baby Teeth joyously explores how good it is to not be dead yet, and how far we will go for love. Aw. You know what? Whew. It's time for our From the Outside In topic. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the Hollywood Outsider Movie Battle Royale. That is where we take eight films, two favorites from each of our hosts, and we determine which one is the ultimate greatest film in the entire whole universe. It is definitely a lot of fun, and it is time to get to it. Let's decide what is the greatest film of a genre. It's time for the movie battle royale. That's right. We are here to talk about 2,000 summer franchises. That's right. All the summer franchises from the year 2000 to now. We're going to determine what was the best one. And to qualify it, we had... A little bit of a debate. We have rules now, okay? We had to determine that it has to be a specific franchise, just like it, ha it can be Spider-Man, but it has to be the Raimi films. It can't just be all the Spider-Man movies. It has to be very specific and not a spinoff. So Hobbs and Shaw wouldn't count, but Fast and Furious would count, you know what I'm saying? And then the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, contains multiple franchises. It doesn't count as one because it's ridiculous when people tell me that that's one franchise. Whatever. Had to have three or more movies from a specific franchise between May 1st and August 31st, between the year 2000 and 2019. Those are the rules. We've got it down to a final eight. Myself, John, and Amanda, and we're joined by my Blacklist Exposed co-host, Troy Heinrichs. Hello, ho, and hosers. Hello. Are you ready to uh, to do this and see how many of these are actually Marvel franchises? <laughs> yes, and if you're all complaining about why Jurassic Park is not included, it's my fault. Just want to get that out of the way up front. It's true. Jurassic Park was in there, but then uh, we had a debate on is Jurassic Park 3, because that actually came out in 2001, something like that. Is that actually a specific part of the specific franchise? And it's not. Jurassic World is its own thing, technically. So 
technically. Men in Black didn't count either. Correct. So because of Troy, we get rid of both of those franchises. Good job, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've never listened to a movie battle royale, what we do is we basically, we've gotten it down to eight, eight finalists. And we do put up a poll. We had a poll going in our, from, in our Facebook group, The Hollywood Outsider, where we let everybody vote on what the top 10 are, were ultimately going to be. And we, we definitely will share that full top 10 when we get to the end. But first, we want to tell you that we've got our final eight based on our picks and that poll. And I'm wondering which one's going to be number one. I am not convinced it's going to be what the listeners picked as number one, but we're about to find out. So here's what we do. We do it and we break it down by whole North and whole South. We each take terms, uh, making our case for our two films, and then we'll vote on them and we'll keep going. Any ties will be determined by that Facebook poll. Are you ready, Amanda? You get to go first in whole North. Ready, Freddy. All right. Let's take her away. My first one is the Dark Knight Trilogy. You wanted me. Here I am. I wanted to see what you'd do. And you didn't disappoint. You let five people die. Then you let Dent take your place. Even to a guy like me, that's cold. Where's Dent? Those mob fools want you gone so they can get back to the way things were. But I know the truth. There's no going back. You've changed things. Forever. And why do you want to kill me? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? The film reboots the Batman film series, telling the origin story of Bruce Wayne from the death of his parents to his journey to become Batman and his fight to stop Raz al Ghul and the Scarecrow from plunging Gotham City into chaos. Batman Begins established the character's origin story with details we had never seen in any previous movie adaptation. The Dark Knight was the first narrative film to use IMAX cameras. And I don't know if you guys knew this. It was pretty well known. So if you didn't, then um, surprise. (laughs) The delayed hospital explosion in The Dark Knight was unscripted. Were you guys familiar with that one? I didn't know it was unscripted. Yeah, so basically <laughs> when Heath Ledger's walking away and he's trying to pre- he tried to press the detonation button, they only had one chance because it was a real hospital they blew up. I knew that. Yeah. And it wasn't working. And so he just kept clicking the button and that was all impromptu. Like he just it was unscripted. He just did it. Hmm. And it turned out to be hysterical and perfect for his character. Absolutely. Some actors in the Dark Knight were genuinely terrified by Heath Ledger's performance. Um, and had said so multiple times because at one point he locked himself away to get into the psychological mindset of the character and did not go as far as another Joker had, you know, in later years. But Heath Ledger, of, of course, unfortunately passed away. And so he was not able to be part of the Dark Knight Rises. So that changed it. But it still is a fantastic trilogy. The Dark Knight perfectly depicted Batman's unique relationship with Joker that was permeated throughout decades of of the comics. The Dark Knight Rises brought the story to a close, forcing Bruce Wayne to confront his innermost demons and figure out what kind of man he actually wanted to be. If you're curious on box office, the Batman Begins film, the first one, made over $48 million, the Dark Knight $158 million, uh, these and are the op- Dark Knight... These are opening weekends, right? Not total. These are opening yeah. domestic only. Okay. $158 million for the Dark Knight, and then the Dark Knight Rises was $160 million for a combined $368 million, $44,218 domestic only on opening weekends for those combined. <laughs> you forgot the two cents. <laughs> Screw your two cents. <laughs> You want my two cents? I didn't care about the box office, but go ahead. (laughs) The Dark Knight was fantastic, even with the horrible attributions that have come with it. When we think about the shooting, when we think about Heath Ledger's death, there are some really sad pieces that go into it. But people were still dedicated to this franchise, and it is absolutely beloved. So that is my first. My next is... Fast and the Furious franchise. So, I'm gonna give you a chance. Take your crew and walk away. That's the only way you're gonna keep your family safe. Your brother never told you never threaten a man's family? 
a pretty stupid thing to do. But I'll make it simple for you. I walk away when she walks away. It's a media franchise centered on the series of action films that are largely concerned with illegal street racing, heists, and spies. And a lot of other weird stuff that they get into later on. Space is coming up. Don't worry. (laughs) The franchise also includes short films, a television series, live shows, video games, and theme park attractions distributed by Universal Pictures. And even though we're not talking about those, the franchise is massive. Everybody who leaves the theater after watching one of those films gets in their stupid Kia or gets in their stupid Honda Accord and revs the engine and decides to speed away and (laughs) figure out how to be as cool as Dominic Toretto. They actually use real street racers in in the films. Vin Diesel's pivotal character was so desired by Universal that he actually traded a cameo in the third for the rights to his character Riddick. I'm sure I know Aaron's familiar with that. one. Yeah, I think it's best deal ever. (laughs) Uh, The third one was not the best, but the films have continued to grow and not only grow in the story development, but in the fan base. And despite how wild the stories can get, I mean, cars on like Arctic ice and they're just insane. The plot premises are insane and never ending. <laughs> plot, Airplane. plot premise. There's no <laughs> plot. <laughs> Family. <laughs> A never ending airplane runway. I mean, some of the most ludicrous things, haha, that you <laughs> could ever imagine. And it somehow works and we're somehow entertained. And every time we come back to these movies. And if you want me to give you the rounding domestic opening weekend, combination for all of the films up to the 8th because the ninth one is pushed to next year 2021 it is 615 million 38,590 dollars for domestic opening weekend so those are my two picks i'm going to go to our guest troy for you to take your vote fast and the furious the dark knight trilogy fast and the furious is fun but the second and third movies are just abysmal in my opinion it doesn't really start until you get to f- number four uh, as part of like the franchise. When you think of the franchise, the first movie is kind of like an introductory standalone. So really, it's like starting at four. Does it become like the franchise concept? Um, I never really was a fan of the first Dark Knight film, to be quite honest. I thought the villain was a little bit lame and <laughs> Katie Holmes was in it. And it was kind of like, eh. Um, but you know, Heath Ledger definitely brought something to the role of the Joker in that second movie. And I think for what it was trying to do to bring Batman back to what Batman should be in in a lot of ways, I would have to pick the dark Knight franchise over fast and the furious. All right. Over to a A Ron. Go to John. I'm still weighing, weighing my (laughs) thoughts. And I'm also uh, bonus points for that ludicrous reference. Nice job. Thank you. (laughs) All right, Johnny, what are you choosing? Dark Knight trilogy or fast and the furious? This might be surprising, but to quantify my feelings as far as what you've just what you've presented to us here, I, I got to say that when it comes to the Dark Knight trilogy, the two of you did something that was very interesting, which was you barely talked about the first or third movie and really just focused on the second movie, which tells me that you're like in a lot of ways that your votes are heavily dependent on that second movie to be able to push along your decisions to uh, choose that movie as the better of the two. Now. When I think of Fast and the Furious, the first one opened up your eyes to a bunch of street racers. The second one, all right, kind of kept you around, I guess. The third one, what the hell just happened? We, <laughs> I don't know what the hell's going on. What was that the accent? The fourth one, yeah. The fourth one, um, what's what's happening here? What spies? What like what? I don't I don't know. The fifth one, a bank vault is being driven down the road, and I can't take my eyes off of it, and I can't stop watching these damn movies. All of a sudden, like when I think about these two series of movies back to back, I will go back to Fast and the Furious at any given moment now and watch them because I feel like they sort of fit into a period in which 
their content and their stories are now more timeless. You, it could be 30 years down the road. We can be outside of dr- having cars that are driven by gas and people and all these other things. We'll still go back and watch these movies because of the, the, the feat of technical driving that was happening and the, and just the interest of every bit of crazy stunts they pulled off. It'll be probably thrown up there like bullet was when it came to the downhill race in, in with the Mustang and the Barracuda. And eventually we're going to get to the point with the dark Knight where we're going to be like, yeah, that second one's pretty great, but I don't know if I can watch those that much anymore. And so thinking of longevity wise, I'm going to have to go with fast and furious. Interesting. And fun fact that bank vault scene, it actually had a car inside inside the vault cool so they smashed a vault and a car <laughs> <laughs> they don't care what they smash they don't care Dumb Aaron, smash. you're a deciding factor here sweet well here's what i i, I ha- actually i already knew my vote but i really wanted to see where john landed so here's what i have to say on this particular topic the the summer franchise movie battle royale is the best summer franchise right that's what we're going for of the 2000s yeah, correct? We all agree on this, right? That's what it's for. Agreed. Summer. Right. Franchise. That's what it's called. Very much like what John said. I said the same thing when Amanda was even, when he, when Amanda was presenting it, her main focus was Heath Ledger and the Dark Knight. Main focus of, of her entire case was for Heath Ledger and the Dark Knight, which I don't disagree with. It's a great trilogy. It's a better movie. I, I think The Dark Knight Rises is a bad, not a bad, but it's not a strong finish. It's just not a strong finish. When it finally gets to the end, okay. But most of that movie, I don't think is great. It's just good. And it doesn't age well with time. Where The Dark Knight, I think, is a perfect movie. Literally one of the most perfect movies. But in terms of a franchise, seriously, when I was weighing the two, because I knew Amanda had these two, I kept coming back to this. I, th- I had a great time. I had to rush out and see all three of those Batman movies the night they came out. Didn't care who came with me. Every time a Fast and Furious, and we did check, and like four movies came out during the time frame, so it counts. Three? Three? Okay, whatever. But it still counts. And then they kind of make their own summer by starting like a week before May, whatever. So (laughs) whatever. They did do that. They did. They did. But they did qualify for our criteria, okay? Mm -hmm. I actually didn't think they did at first, and they did. (laughs) When I go see a Fast and Furious movie, I want to go with everybody. I want to go with 10 people. I want to go with... 15, whatever. I want a whole row of people I know watching those movies. And that is what says summer box office, summer franchise, summer excitement to me is going to a movie and getting pumped up with your friends. And you put those two together, as much as I love the Dark Knight trilogy, Fast and Furious is always way more fun. And that's what I uh, equate summer franchises to. All right. So... The, the Dark Knight. No, I'm just kidding. So Fast and Furious moves on. It sure does. They vroom vroom into the next. <laughs> okay. Well, mo- <laughs> moving moving on. And by, by the way, F- Fur- uh, Furious 7, I cried at the end. I didn't cry in Who Dark Knight. Who didn't? If you didn't cry, you're a monster. Right? Oh, my God. The tears. <sighs> well, apparently Troy didn't. Troy didn't cry. Okay. So now it's my turn. And I'm starting with the Captain America trilogy. But you didn't answer my question. Do you want to kill Nazis? Is this a test? Yes. I don't want to kill anyone. I don't like bullies. I don't care where they're from. Well, there are already so many big men fighting this war. Maybe what we need now is a little guy, huh? I can offer you a chance. Only a chance. That's right. The first Avenger, the Winter Soldier, and Civil War. Not a bad film in there. And they're the best films in the MCU thus far, in my opinion. But what do they do better than all the other franchises? They've got Chris Evans, for starters. No better Captain America exists that I've seen that even could play that character. As he introduced the character from his tiny, skinny, scrawny little origins to his fully fleshed out growth spurt. Steve Rogers has Mm. heart. He has courage. He has determination, and most importantly, he has dignity. He wants to do the right thing simply because it's right. No other reason needed, and he could do it all day. The first film started decades ago, leapt into modern times, and none of the differences mattered because it was still our Steve, our Cap, 
leading the charge. Audiences love the action as much as the romance on screen and off between Cap and Peggy Carter, the most emotional part of any of the Marvel films, in my opinion, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe films, because, you know, they don't include Uncle Ben. Though Civil War became a bit of, uh, a little bit of Avengers at more than Cap at times, it still was very much a Captain America film, and all three films still work as Soul Avengers. So these films, to me, have not aged at all. I know that's they're fairly recent, but that's still, you know, they've got some years behind them now. They're fairly timeless and hold up way better as a trilogy than either Iron Man or Thor does. Steve Rogers truly is America's ass. Now, I ask you... <sighs> Well, not yet. I haven't introduced my second one. Hang on. Here's my second one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the next one is... Even Aaron's like, just pick <laughs> just pick Captain America. No, because I have just <laughs> as much passion for the second one. The next one is the, Spy- the Spider-Man trilogy, the Sam Raimi films. Pete, look, you're changing. I know. I went through exactly the same thing at your age. No, not exactly. Peter... These are the years when a man changes into the man he's going to become the rest of his life. Just be careful who you change into. This guy, Flash Thompson, he probably deserved what happened. But just because you can beat him up doesn't give you the right to. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Now, Spider-Man came the year after the first X-Men. It was a comic book series that had never been a fully-fledged movie, and no one knew if it could even be done. They brought on Sam Raimi, a renowned horror director. (laughs) They brought on Tobey Maguire and Kristen Dunst. They used the Halloween costumes left over from a Target sale for the Green Goblin. Nothing in writing sounds like this film, the first film especially, would lead to one of the greatest superhero series of all time. But... With great power comes great responsibility. And Sam Raimi lived up to the challenge. For three films, the cast and crew of the Spider-Man films brought to life a character full of heart, full of pain, full of depth. The panels of thousands of comics that I grew up on were brought vividly to life. The life lessons that modeled Peter Parker into the man that he would become stemming from the death of his beloved Uncle Ben when they acknowledged it in the old movies (laughs) were all there on screen. Spider-Man dazzled audiences with its fantastic special effects, deftly managed the story, and had more iconic moments than any single franchise deserves. The upside-down kiss between Peter and MJ, Aunt May's hero speech, and the death of Uncle Ben himself. The third film, yes, some people will mention that it had issues because of the emo antics and the dancing, but it's still, it's still a good film overall. And the first two are near perfection. This is the friendly neighborhood franchise we deserve. Now, those are the two, Captain America and Spider-Man. Very, very tough in my book to pick, so I'm glad I don't have to choose between these two because, honestly, I don't know where I would land. Amanda, what do you think? Mm. You know, I really enjoyed getting familiar with both of these characters because these films, for the most part, introduced me to them. I did not have the comic reference. I mean, I understood who they were and what they were on the basic level, but did not fully understand the intricacies of their personalities and their world. And I feel like both of these franchises gave me that. But only one of them reminds me of Summer. Only one makes me feel like I have to go back and rewatch the films. Only one do I enjoy all of, all of them. And that is Spider-Man. Excellent. Uh, Troy. She set that up really well. I was like, only one of them I have to rewatch. I was like, I don't need to rewatch Spider Man, <laughs> especially not the third movie. But I'll watch him. I'll watch him. Third one is not as bad as people like to say. It just got Agreed. a couple bad elements. It's not. It's not that bad. It just has a few bad elements. I think when it comes down to these two franchises in particular, I think that Spider Man stands on its own much better. Captain America where it is a franchise and it has three movies, it is still supported by other content in the MCU that if you were to lift Captain America 2, Winter Soldier, and um, Captain America 3, Civil War, those movies will not be as good as they are without the other MCU backstory in it. Captain America, The First Avenger by itself is a great movie. So I don't think the franchise holds up from a film perspective on its own where the Spider-Man series is definitely the Peter Parker story. 
uh, that we come to know and love. Uh, we fall in love with Mary Jane. We fall in love with Uncle Ben and cry our eyes out when he passes away. I mean, there's everything that has to do with, you know, popcorn and excitement and adventure and action. And I really think that where you can use modern technology in the Captain America series to make it bombastic and be summer feeling, it doesn't say summer like Spider-Man did when it first came out. Like when, when it was like, oh, new Spider-Man movie, like when number two came out, we were so excited and we all showed up to the theater in droves to see what the second movie had in store. So I'll have to go with Amanda and say Spider-Man. Woo woo. Because it's the one universe that has Uncle Ben. Sorry, Chris Evans, I still oh, love stop you. It. <laughs> Jen, stop kissing his Your ass. vote doesn't matter, but uh, no, go it ahead. really doesn't. You know, I, I don't need to go into a lot of pomp and circumstance about this because uh, it's been like my vote doesn't really count. But I would totally go Captain America over Spider-Man because I believe that Captain America is a much more enjoyable story to sit through from the beginning to beginning to end and through. Uh, uh, and I'll watch every every movie as many times as I can without issue. Whereas. I know exactly how many times I've seen that third Spider-Man movie, and that's once. Hmm. I've seen the other two movies several times, but that third one, I haven't been interested in watching more than that first viewing. So sounds like a personal problem. And not necessarily saying that it's got some great elements to it. You know, Sandman is fantastic. There's some great elements. I mean, it's got some great elements to it, but you know, the my feeling about when I when I came out of that movie wasn't something where I was like, I can't wait to see that again, and it just never really happened again afterwards. All right. Well, it doesn't matter because Spider-Man's moving on. So now we go to <laughs> Ho South and John leads the charge. All right. So my very first movie that I'm going to throw into this pot of weirdness is going to be Harry Potter. Woo! Mr. Potter, our new celebrity. Tell me, what would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? You don't know? Well, let's try again. Where, Mr. Potter, would you look if I asked you to find me a bezoar? I don't know, sir. And what is the difference between monkshood and wolfbane? I don't know, sir. Pity. Clearly, fame isn't everything. All right, so let me set up the backstory for you. As far as back as 1997, film producer David Heyman was handed J.K. Rowling's first book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. He thought it was a stupid title and didn't want to be rude about it, so he just like put the book on a shelf and then forg- forgot about it. And if you're like, wait a minute, what? Yeah, the guy who brought us movie like Day Trippers, Juice, Stone Age, Ravenous, he looked at the title of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and said, that's dumb. Okay. Then his assistant got his her hands on it, read the book, and put it in his hand and said, you really need to read this because this is what's up. And then what follows is a series of eight movies that captured the imaginations of children and adults across the world. It inspired an entirely new generation to pick up books. Books with no pictures in them, no nothing. It's books. Real books. I can't believe it. And... Every one of these movies, in their own way, has a perfect way of b- developing a nice, wistful feeling and answers every little bit of needs that I need. Uh, if I need to relax, Harry Potter saga. If I want to feel cold in the middle of a brimstone summer here in Florida, I put on Harry Potter. If I want to feel, if I'm feeling sick and tired, I put on Harry Potter. I argue that Harry Potter makes a great summer f- movie franchise, not because. All the movies came out in the summer because they didn't, but because the movie, this, this whole series transcends the, the idea of summer and becomes something that is magical and viewable throughout the year. And that's why I chose Harry Potter. Hmm. Now, my next series of movies that I brought up was something completely different and something I love just as much, and that's the Mission Impossible series. Pull over and listen to me, will you? Just listen. Listen to what? I need your help. I think you could use mine. Your help? What are you talking about? I'm talking about Scotland Yard, Interpol, every Dutch authority. I can make them all go away. Oh, bloody hell. You're a spy. Well, if you want me, you got to catch me. Go! 
what can I say to quantify the Mission Impossible series to you guys? Uh, you got a crazy star who insists on doing all his own stu- <laughs> stunts. The very f- first movie came out in 1996, and they just keep on coming, and he still keeps on doing these stupid stunts where he's going to get himself killed. And it, and we can't wait to stop, you know, to watch him do it. It's great. The stories keep on getting crazier, but yet f- still fit very well into the world they're building. And again, it's something that when it comes to a summer movie. I think about a big group of friends who got together and sat in front of the movie screen and just hooted and hollered and yelled and ske- and just screamed about how happy they are to see their favorite people and their favorite team of agents work together to save us from whatever kind of dangers are out there in the world. And that's why I chose that as my second series. Nice. Those are my two movies. Aaron, I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> oh, boy. You might regret it. All right. So Harry Potter versus Mission Impossible. That's that's an interesting that's an interesting dynamic. Hmm. Hmm. Because I think wasn't Tom Cruise the same age as Harry Potter when he started this franchise? I don't know. Anyway, on the same height at least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, same look. Uh. Definitely. All right. So here's what I would say: Harry Potter is a franchise that I love to go see with my kids because they loved it so much. But they're not part of this equation. It's summer franchise edition and i don't enjoy the harry potter films that much (gasps) i just don't i have this big problem with the whole series where harry potter is the most useless lead character in history where he does nothing until like the very last movie he's just like he's always got his ass saved every single film and all that did was get frustrated like okay another school year another oh thank god somebody is there to save mr potter and that got old to me pretty quick he saved people too it's called teamwork. Yeah. Makes the dream work. Yeah, it's Aaron. called Hermione and it's called Ron. That's that's who saved people. Herm- Mostly Hermione. This should they should just make redo this. If they ever remake it, make her the star because she's actually the star of the freaking franchise. She's the only one that ever did anything until that last movie. So I'm personally not a huge fan. Now, Mission Impossible, I will tell you, I can't remember a single plot for many of those movies. <laughs> I don't know what any of them are about. I don't care. I go to watch those because they are Whiz, bang, zoom, fun. And they are every single time. There's so many memorable scenes from those movies. Ghost Protocol, just, you know, scaling that freaking building. And he's flying on a plane. And it's all the the crazy Tom Cruise stunts. Yes. But that's what makes those movies so exciting. And they are always thrilling, even if I don't know what the plot points are. And also, it's a Mission Impossible movie that is the reason you have that stupid mustache issue with Justice League. That should get a a mention all by itself. So I'm going Mission Impossible. (laughs) All right, Troy. Uh, I won't even go on that long because Harry Potter is a Christmas movie. It is not a summer movie. Just because it was released in summer and qualifies by the rules, it has never been considered a summer movie that I would go watch and do the popcorn big blockbuster concept. So Mission Impossible says that 100% is the thing you look forward to the most on the 4th of July when it came out. Um, it was just, it was the, the thing to go see during the summer. And so mission impossible. It's going to move on. Sorry. You should have picked Harry Potter, Amanda. (laughs) I'm going to just leave this podcast now. There's no use anymore. There's no saving. You could tell us a thousand times though, why you love Harry Potter. It'd be fine. We'll, we'll let you. I, well, I've well hang it. on. Like, are you saying it doesn't qualify as a summer franchise just because for you, the to whimsical... Me. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, no, it, it's your it, vote. It, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a Christmas scene. There's a pumpkin Hollywood. There's a Halloween scene in the first... I mean, it, it screams holiday movie. It doesn't scream summer movie from the jump. I watch it in the summer. <laughs> I would go to the theater right now if they rewatched, if they re- released them. They might. They might, because that's the only thing they have to show. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your vote, Amanda? What do you think my vote is? And this isn't even because I'm sure Aaron's going to really just quickly jump on. It's because you don't like Tom Cruise. No, it's because you worship Harry Potter. I I get it. I love Harry Potter. I do. And I don't feel like a movie needs to only be like Harry Potter was one that regardless of how Troy feels right now has sold out significantly more midnight showings to the point where it was like four or five in the morning and finally cut off adding more show times because we just had to call it a night because I remember working there. 
there's never been that same experience for Mission Impossible. People do run out to the theater, and I'm not denying that it is a, a good summer franchise because it, it's very actiony and feels that way. But people go in crowds and sell out theaters for Harry Potter, or they did when they were releasing. And to me, that is what summer franchises are for. It's not necessarily a movie that takes place in the summer. It's about getting everybody together because school is out for summer. <laughs> you know, like you just want to go out and you want to be together with your group. You want to have a good time. You're there to have fun. You're there to enjoy yourself. And Harry Potter did that for so many people endlessly, every single movie, just nonstop till 4 a.m. on the release night. And then the whole weekend and then weeks and weeks <laughs> after that. So... Well, when we do the movie battle royale, best movies from midnight to 6 a.m., we'll bring Harry Potter back into the conversation and you can pick Troy, it. you're never coming back again. <laughs> All right. So there's also, there's, also a, there's also a giant chasm. Don't make it worse your, for yourself. Between Don't make hate. it worse for yourself. <laughs> there's a giant chasm for your hate between Tom Cruise and Harry Potter love. And Tom Cruise would be able to jump that chasm, by the way. <laughs> no, he wouldn't. He would break his hip. No, he, yeah. Keep telling. The guy's got to go into space for a movie. Trust me, he's going to be fine. That doesn't mean he's going to be all right. He'll have a replacement <laughs> hip by then. It's fine. All right. So that's, man, Mission Impossible took out Harry Potter. Oh, one more thing the guy couldn't win at. <laughs> Harry Potter sucks. All right, Troy, what are your two? Well, both of my options tell really great stories. Both the options have really great cast and crew that add to the overall production, and they both have acting by Andy Serkis. So they both have exactly what it takes to be solid summer franchises. So let's first talk about the Avengers. There was an idea. Stark knows this. Called the Avengers Initiative. The idea was to bring together a group of remarkable people see if they could become something more see if they could work together when we needed them to to fight the battles that we never could Phil Coulson died still believing in that idea in heroes now, this is a mini franchise inside a larger universe, four movies showcasing the power of teamwork while completely obliterating cities, alien planets, and even time itself. Just shy of eight billion globally on a budget of $1 billion, which is a return on investment, which is important, uh, of a ratio of eight to one, the Avengers is the definition of summer popcorn entertainment. All four movies had cohesive standalone stories, even though they do build off the previous MCU material to set up why they needed to assemble. You can sit down and watch all four of these and not know anything else and still massively enjoy the films. Avengers 2 had a bit of a drop from the first and probably is the anchor in the entire series, where Infinity War is probably the best start to finish Avengers movie in the franchise, showing that staying power is still there for the franchise as it went into its global domination of Endgame which made the most bank, but that's because it had over 10 years of hype leading into it. Just as a point of note, it also had a secondary release. Um, where they had post credit scenes, they both set up more of the universe than they set up the actual franchise itself, and Andy Serkis was in the second movie. An audience has come back to these specifically because of the genre's escapism as the primary reason. We can relax and forget our everyday problems. Moreover, superheroes are like role models many people want to live up to. A viewer likes the idea of saving others, being brave and popular, and fighting against the evil. Superheroes incorporate the idea of justice, loyalty, truth, and power, and these are all things we as an audience give great value to in our society. Superhero movies also offer broad appeal to audiences. Superhero movies have evolved and changed to fit the interests of today's audience in particular and to meet new fads in pop culture. Graphic scenes of violence in today's superhero movies are also low, which means even small children are allowed to watch them. And that is what The Avengers brings to the table. The second movie is The Planet of the Apes, the 2000s edition. I do not start this war. The ape who did is dead. His name was Koba. I killed him. 
of his vengeance. Now, I fight only to protect apes. This franchise consists of Rise of the Planet of the Apes in 2011, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes in 2014, and War for the Planet of the Apes in 2017. This franchise starts out as a great bonding story, for lack of a better term, between a man and his, well, brother. That brother just happens to be a primate. It tells the real story of what it means to be human as the humans find out what the apes are capable of, and also the apes find out what the apes are capable of in the second film. It also showcases what it means to be truly a leader against opposition and how to overcome immense obstacles to arrive at your endgame, all without superpowers. $1.7 billion worldwide on a budget of $450 million, making it a 3.8 to 1 on the ROI index, which may not hold a candle to the Avengers, who did have a fourth movie, remember, and also it released twice. But the second movie of Planet of the Apes specifically actually made twice as much money as the first movie, which is unheard of in franchise capability because the second movie typically always tanks. So because of that, we actually have this second movie globally bucking the trend that sequels can actually succeed over their originals, unlike Avengers' second movie. The Apes franchise of the teens took what was an interesting sci-fi topic for the geek culture of the early 70s and made it more accessible to the rest of the world, where both geek and non-geek cultures could sit down and fall in love with Caesar and his band of brothers, whether they were both human or ape. Uh, Apes sets up the next movie in its franchise with a post credit scene also, as we see the pilot infected with the drug get on a plane and spread it around the entire world. Why this deserves the vote, though, is because this wasn't a huge IP. It was not the Power Rangers or Transformers or even Avengers of its day. It was a cheesy sci-fi series that took a step back to say, how do we make a great movie that connects with all the same audiences that a super blockbuster would connect with and do it with grit, emotion, heart, and literally fly its fists at the oppressors of the Hollywood brass? War even does such a great job of showing what humanity is all about, the sanctity of life, the utility of mercy versus the productive violence, the process of sculpting society from chaos, the reality of war itself and its compromises and its casualties. It actually makes Avengers final two pictures look like a glossed over bubblegum version that doesn't hit the same impact. Oh, and Andy Serkis was in all three of these movies. So with that, I shall go to you, my fellow South compatriot, Mr. John. Well, I don't even really need to get into this too much uh, because on the one hand, I don't think the Avengers are a great well i think they're great movies they don't stand alone very well because they do have a lot that comes from the other movies that mix and match into what we have in the into this franchise but on the other hand i hate planet of the apes well wow i don't see why people enjoy those movies i don't i don't i just don't get it i don't like them i've watched all all of them and i've been every single time i've gone yeah that was all right so i'm gonna have to say avengers Hmm. uh amanda well, this is really easy because only one of your franchises technically qualifies underneath the rules. How do you figure? How do you figure? Because the Avengers released on May 4th, 2012. That's one. Um, Age Voltron released on May 1st, 2015. That's two. Infinity War released on April 27th, 2018. And then Endgame released on April 26th, 2019. Mm. Well, it was the first weekend. We took a vote. It passed. <laughs> All right. Technically, you counted it in your Summer Mover preview when you said that Summer started a week early for Avengers back it's, on this podcast. true. We did. We took a vote. I'm just pass. going by but, his official but per, rules. Per these rules, technically, it isn't after May 1st. So. It's true. But you know what? We made an exception and the listeners voted for it. So. <laughs> uh, well, I am going to go with the Avengers. And it's part of it is because of the franchise itself. I was not a big fan of Age of Ultron like at all i, I kind of usually skip over that one when i do rewatches however i was able to take my nephew to see these films in theaters and it was always something that was really special to do together and i've talked about it on the show numerous times about how it's each year that we were able to do that was the best experience of the entire year and that's kind of hard to beat it's kind of hard to to have your best memories th- from a year revolve around that franchise opening up another film and going with it and having a great time. That was like the opening of summer. See? So it does count. 
I'm just saying they're your rules. Yeah, I know. I, I forgot. The, the listeners voted it in, though. So and there you go. It's there. Um, I'm going to go with the Avengers as well, Troy. Uh, it's, it's You know what the thing is? It's like I think the Planet of the Apes, unlike John, I think it's a fantastic franchise. Mm-hmm. I really wouldn't care when they came out. So, but they have snow in some of the scenes, so you don't want to think that they're summer yeah. films. Avengers, I'm, I'm just Avengers. It, it's just to me. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, I'm to, tracking with you. To me, like that, those films <laughs> have always kicked off summer. I don't understand with the snow. I don't get it. What did I mean? Because Harry picking Potter, on Troy, right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Another one that apparently doesn't work in his rules, but it works when it's convenient for him. Hmm. That's an excellent point. These feel like fall films, really. <laughs> Maybe early winter. Yeah. So the Avengers are definitely, they kick off summer. All right. So now we've got that done and we can get to it. We can actually vote. We don't have to go into as much detail. We can just have fun now. So here we go. We're going to vote for the best of Ho North and the best of Ho South, and then those will go to the final. So from Ho North, the winner is Fast and Furious versus spider-man and any ties will be decided by our listener poll troy you're our guest between fast and furious and spider-man and since you've already alluded to how much you don't like fast and the furious i'm gonna guess which way you're gonna go but i'll keep that to myself in case the you know fans want to do it that too what do you vote for troy uh spider-man versus fast and the furious spider-man takes out all the cars and ties them all up hands down <laughs> okay amanda fast and the furious Ooh, John. Fast and the Furious. <laughs> this is going to be shit. Go ahead, Aaron. Tell us, will you leave Uncle Ben the way the MCU did? Or will you go in the car? I will we'll take- be back right after this. <laughs> I, will, I will take the Spider-Man trilogy because it has Uncle Ben. And if they would have that in the MCU, I would go for that a little bit more often than the MCU. But it doesn't have it. So here, I have to go here. I'm going to go for that. So you sound tight. sad about your choice. <laughs> no, I'm not sad. I'm sad about the lack of Uncle Ben in the current MCU. Mm, That's what I mean. Okay. But that means it's a tie. So that means we have to go to the listener poll to determine which wins, right? Fast and Furious versus Spider-Man. According to listeners, the winner would be by one vote, Fast and Furious. <laughs> oh, wow. I forgot to vote. I too late. Too late. <laughs> Too late. Fast uh, and Furious funny. moves to the final round. All right. Now we come to the second round, Ho South, which is Mission Impossible, not Harry Potter, versus the Avengers, mm. not Planet of the Apes, because those, those two series are all holiday themed. So what <laughs> what are we going bet <laughs> <laughs> between Mission Impossible and the Avengers? What say you, Amanda? Oh, this is the easiest, uh, the Avengers. Okay, Troy? I, I laughed so hard at that winter comment. Um, so that was Avengers versus Mission Impossible? Mm-hmm. Man, that's tough. Come back to me. No, it's not. Yes, right. it is. John? Oh, man. See? It's tough. By definition, summer blockbuster, summer franchise, it's tough. This is really tough because it's problematic because it's like, one movie is one that I propose, and the other movie is one that I didn't. So, like, do if I if I choose my movie, then all of a sudden, like, I'm being biased. But if I don't choose my movie, then oh, sh you know, just pick the it's, movie. It's the only pick fair the way. right franchise. He's pick just trying to buy himself time while he thinks. Yeah, that feels right. Feels right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to say Avengers because Avengers is something that was always a party to go see with a huge group of friends, whereas. As much as I wanted a huge group of friends to go see Mission Impossible, sometimes you'd get people be like, eh, I don't know. I, you know maybe I'll <laughs> be there. Fair. But Avengers, everybody showed up every single time. All right, Troy. Well, whether Aaron picks Avengers or Aaron picks Mission Impossible, it won't matter because the title will go to the Avengers most likely in the poll. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to be emo about the whole thing and pick Mission Impossible and do my best Tom Cruise. <laughs> well, I would pick <laughs> I would pick the Avengers anyway, so don't worry about them. <laughs> My most emo. All right. So that brings us to the finals. Dun, 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 dun. This is where, in my mind, it really just got a lot harder because I really thought it was going to be the Dark Knight trilogy versus the Avengers. And uh, that wouldn't be as difficult. This is super hard for me. So the Fast and the Furious versus the Avengers for the best summer franchise of the 2000s. Troy, you're our guest. I'll let you go first. What do you, what do you got? I think this one seems easy based on your earlier. 
comments. Yeah, but see, I I still think the Avengers isn't a franchise. I think it has it it plays off of other material to work where Fast and the Furious stands alone. Even though I'm not a fan, I think it's still when you think summer, you think cars and blowing stuff up. So I'm gonna have to say Fast and the Furious from summer hmm. franchise perspective. All right, John. I'm gonna go with the same argument actually, Fast and the Furious, because it is a a good good old fashioned summer movie, whiz bang fun. Fast and the Furious, it is. Manda. I'm going Fast and the Furious also, Woo-hoo! not just by default, but because I genuinely, there's so many more movies and it feels like they get crazier and crazier every time. And so not only do you look forward to the next movie, but you look forward to figuring out what crazy batshit idea they came up with this time. I have been thinking about this since you guys started talking. When I think summer, I think when I was younger and doing stupid things and being dumb and just smiling and nothing makes me smile more than Fast and Furious movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They just are. They're ridiculous. So I can't believe I'm saying this, but the winner of the <laughs> summer movie franchise Battle Royale is the Fast and the Furious. It's all about family. <laughs> <laughs> Family wins. And if you want a drinking game, just do a shot every time that they say family in the franchise when you do your rewatch. You're dead. Ohana. <laughs> you will be dead. Raise your hand if you've uh, left the parking lot of a theater after seeing one of those movies and tried to go either really fast or jump a curve. Yeah. No one can see, Aaron. Yeah, everybody's got their hands raised for what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, so here's what the listener top 10. So there we go. The Fast and the Furious took out the Avengers. Something finally beat Iron Uncle Ben Man. Okay, so here is the top 10 <laughs> from listeners. Number 10 on. Number 10, Spider-Man, the Raimi series. Number 9, the Fast and Furious series. Number 8, Star Trek. Would qualify. It's a good call. It's a good call. Just a surprising one, honestly. Uh, Mission Impossible. Then we go to Planet of the Apes. Now, here's one we didn't talk about in, in all of this. I mean, we just talked about Star Trek, but Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, mm. I remember when we were uh, we were picking our finals, and it, ke- it actually came down to me, and I had, between Spider-Man and Pirates of the Caribbean, I had a real struggle because I love the Pirates movies, but they just don't hold up as a franchise as a whole. Right. I agree. That ship goes down really quick after the third one. <laughs> Ha-ha! Goes really down after the first one. Honestly, yeah, second one. <laughs> second one's actually pretty fun. Um, Harry Potter. Oh, look at that. Number Troy, four. I guess other people see it as a summer film franchise. Wow. It's only because they didn't know any better. Because they just had the poll to pick from. <laughs> and they were like, oh, I like Harry Potter. I'll pick that. They mm. could add their own. No, it's because they don't uh, think of their movies as seasonal. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> they just watch movies, man. Uh, number three <laughs> is Captain America. Number two, the Dark Knight trilogy. Boy, those what? people are going to be pissed. <laughs> number one, the Avengers, which didn't win. Suck it. <laughs> See, Pat- Batman would have been a great trilogy to bring out like at Halloween. What? Why, why, yeah. What is in your head that you think everything has to be- revolve around a holiday? <laughs> the whole theme was a holiday. Summer. Summer's Summer, a holiday. Summer's, um, uh, season? Summer is a season. It's not a holiday. Teachers get it as a holiday every year. <laughs> I don't understand your argument. Okay. You know what? That's teachers. Suck. That's, <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> that's our John at the Hollywood outsider.com. All right. Any uh, closing <laughs> thoughts or recommendations? I don't have anything. I feel like we've talked ad nauseum. There isn't a whole lot that I've uh, seen. You guys got anything you want to recommend? Troy, you're a guest. Have you seen anything you want people to check out? Uh, I just checked out Zoe's extraordinary playlist and it got a season two. So if you have not seen that, highly recommend it. So much fun. Be sure you like singing. It's very important. Aaron doesn't like fun. <laughs> I don't. I don't like fun. Big anti-fun guy. Uh, John, anything? I got nothing. I'm still trying to recover from the movie I watched. <laughs> the Panama Chronicles. Amanda? Right. I'm on the same boat as Johnny right now. Gotcha. Man. Ooh, I, I, do have, I do have a recommendation, though. If it's um, Artemis since... Fowl, you're wrong. No. I haven't even, <laughs> I haven't even touched that with the 10-foot pole. Um, no, if you're, if you're a Mac user and you have one of those fancy Macs that have the touch bar on it, um, that literally does absolutely nothing and it's a waste of space. I found the one app that would apply to this audience in particular, and it's called Clicker. 
Clicker for Netflix, Clicker for Hulu, Clicker for Disney Plus, and Clicker for YouTube TV. Um, what it does is it installs those services as a native app on your Mac, so you don't have to watch it in the browser. And on the touch bar, it actually puts your neck, your like continue watching list on the touch bar. So when one tap, you can be boom back watching your show, and then hmm. you can hit, tap one button and jump out, and boom, jump right to another show. It and it's got a one button pop out window feature as well. So if you're a if you're a person that watches your streaming stuff on your computer and you have a Mac with a touch bar, highly recommend Clicker. I'll get the uh, link for Aaron to put in the show notes. Is this your whole treat, Teachable Minute? That, no. That just, no, no, there's no. more. Okay. He's just adding work for you. Yeah, that's all. I appreciate exactly. that because the notes are done. So I don't know if that's going to be there. But Troy can, I'm sure, provide it if you reach out to him pi- privately. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> share your At thoughts. Troy on Twitter. I'll be there happy you to go. share. Share your thoughts on this episode or anything else on our Facebook group or on Twitter at by Popcorn. Our site is thehollywoodoutsider.com. Be sure to rate and subscribe us on your preferred podcast app. Next week is number 400. You can find John's artwork on Insta and Twitter at Arjun Draws, Amanda on Veronica's Marshmallows and Smirk, and at Sink Into This, and me on The Blacklist Exposed with this numbnut, and presenting Hitchcock as well as at Aaron Smirks. Troy, the teachable minute, the whole teachable minute. You get one minute or less to tell the audience one thing you learned from any movie or TV show over the past week. I checked out the Amazing Stories reboot on Apple TV Plus, and I'm going to spoil the season one finale because they are standalone episodes and nobody has Apple TV Plus. But in this episode, <laughs> the pilot uh, time travels from the past to the future through a rift. And in the past, when these rifts have happened, there have been major catastrophes like tsunamis and earthquakes and basically just wrecks humanity. And so the whole point of the episode is get the pilot back through the rift with everything that he came here with. And unfortunately, when he flies back through the rift, he is missing a simple candy bar. And as you sit there and you wait for him to go through the hole and you're waiting and you're waiting, you're waiting. And oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? He goes through the rift and nothing happens. No big boom. So what I took away from this was that uh, I think we worry about the small stuff a little bit too much rather than just brushing it off from time to time. Um, There are times when we need to pay attention and execute flawlessly, but there are other times that, you know, if it isn't perfect, it's not the end of the world. 2020 is making that happen all on its own without your help. So don't sweat the small stuff. It'll be okay. That's a good one. I like it. Uh huh. See that, John? He's, that that was positivity is what that was. Yeah, that's pretty good. I I really appreciate it. What? Johnny complimented. (laughs) Glad I could be here. Thanks for the invite. There's enough people out there being dicks to one another. They don't need me doing it, too. Fair enough. Aww. Fair enough. Oof. All right. Well, we got a lot to do for next week, so be sure to come back next week for episode 400, and I'm going to go and watch some Fast and Furious movies. So remember, the next time you head to a theater, which is coming up in July, according to all the lies and myths going on, because I should say Tenet has been pushed to July 31st, but they are very confident that is the date when it's going to release. Christopher Nolan is supposed to be very adamant warner brothers wanted to delay it further and he's like no i want people to think i saved cinema so it's very important that july 31st is when tenant comes out so we are a little less than a month and a half away from tenant coming out and theaters coming back so remember the next time you head to a theater eventually buy popcorn Woo! man under an hour for you maybe I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>